Get let's take a moment and say thank you to our sponsors at Fuji Sport. Yeah, absolutely. They've been working with us for, for a very long time, not only on this podcast, but also at the Academy. Um, and I'm peeking, taking a peek at, at their website right now, and they have a brand new ultra light gi. Now, this is mind blowing. I'm looking at my size A2 is 2.75 pounds. I mean, that's under three pounds. That's, yeah. that's mind blowing. I could even lift that. And uh, go to their website, fujisports.com. Check it out. Anything you could need for your jujitsu journey, you can find at fujisports.com. Hey, it's been a while since we started Roll TV Project. Uh, it's been a while since you started it. I did come in later, and um, I can't say enough about it, especially the new platform. It's really amazing, fully customizable, uh, and you know a little bit more about the structure. Well, so two things you need to know. One is the subscription service, which is 9 bucks a month. Um, you can get access to hundreds of videos, hundreds of drills, techniques, and so on, in a very nice labor, library categorized as you need them. But two different lessons. Um, you can actually purchase those individually, and you own them, so the subscription is not tied to it at all. You can look at things like spider guard, half guard sweeps, half guard chokes, um, uh, folding pass, and so on. There are so many of them out there. So take a look um, and see where you need help with the videos, right? 30%. If you type in Roll Radio as a code, who doesn't like saving money, go to RollAcademy.tv. What's up, everyone, and welcome back. If you haven't already, please remember to hit the like, share, subscribe, download, listen, and whatever other button there is, and leave us a review wherever you do listen. That ensures that we can continue bringing you the great guests and amazing content that you have come to expect. Today's guest is Coach World Champions and many of the legends of MMA. He has worked with Gray Maynard, Vitor Belfort, Chael Sonnen, Dominic Cruz, and Randy Couture, just to name a few. On this episode, Neil Melanson shares his unique coaching style, the ins and outs of what he loves about and hates about the fight game, and his incredible dedication to his fighters. Here's the Roll Radio with former coach of the Black Zillions and Extreme Couture, a Navy veteran, and former United States Air Marshal, and the man who literally wrote the book on the triangle choke, Neil Melanson. Welcome to Raw Radio. Sorry for the delay. I didn't mean to be uh, shit bagging it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, it's no problem. I think uh, this is this is uh, good. I think that um, you know. We all have problems, but here we are. Well, so. listen, we are live. Well, yeah. <laughs> we we are rolling. Uh, Neil, g uh, good to see you. Um, welcome to the show. Um, you know, despite Thanks. some of the obstacles, um, I'm glad to I'm glad to see you. How is everything going by you? It's well. It's well. Staying staying busy. I'm I'm happy and healthy. I'm just trying to, you know, just looking for adventure. <laughs> looking for adventure. <laughs> Hey, listen, is it, I read a rumor, Gary told told us, we were talking about this earlier, that um, a little rumor, or maybe it's true about your toe. Is that true that you, you <laughs> it's not a your rumor. Toe, toe off to, a lim to, to minimize the amount of time of um, that you were off the mat? Yeah. T tell me that story. That sounds crazy. Well, it was a long time ago. I don't see it. I don't know. It was at least over a decade. And... Um, I was coaching at Extreme Couture. I had a grappling program there, but I was also working with select fighters. You know, I didn't run any pro team. I just, it was, it's a training center. It's not so much like one team, a lot of teams train out of there. So uh, I was, you know, Randy had hired me. So I was Randy's coach. And uh, then I started working with other athletes and, you know, Vitor and, you know, great man. We had a ton of athletes there. So it was kind of like, um, I was fortunate. I got to be extreme during its peak, you know, where mm -hmm. everybody wanted to be around the Nats, you know, and everybody wanted to train with them. Everybody wanted to do this. So I got to work with a lot of athletes, um, even like, even if it was for one camp, like I trained sexy Yama for a camp, you know, like he's, I worked with a lot of different guys and, um, I wasn't just like a coach. Uh, I've always been, um, uh, somebody that will spar with you, 
you know, I, I spar with you and I kind of coach you through that. You know, I took some of my dog handling principles I learned when I was in the service and uh, I brought it over to the man. It was very successful. It, it, it cut down the amount of time of development. So I could really get athletes up to that level in a short amount of time. Downfall is I got to be the one doing it. Just like the guy in the dog suit, you know, I, I have to be the one that, um, you know, puts the body out there. So meaning, you know, beginning of the camp, I stick you pretty hard, get you frustrated, put you away real fast, you know, cause it's my area of expertise, you know, and, um, start teaching the principles and then back it off sometimes then closer to camp you're you're winning more and i purposely fail so i'm basically training you without even talking the downfall is my body takes a lot of abuse so when when you're like that these athletes count on you not just for what you're going to say they count on you for what you're going to do so they needed my body and, but I'm still doing the hobbyist. I'm still on a great time. I had a great group of kids. I really was really happy with that. But, you know, we get wanderers and they come in and they take a class and I would roll with everybody, you know? And when I roll with hobbyists, I'm not trying to kill them. I'm just letting them work. You know, most of the time when you're a coach, at least the kind of coach I was, if I roll with you, most of the time I'm doing it for you, not grappling for me. And if I'm going to grapple for me, I'm going to tell you like, Hey, I'm going to get after it. So this kid, I've never seen him before. He looked like he was a white belt, maybe a blue. I'd have no idea. And, um, you know, I was just toying with him. I dropped back for a straight ankle, but I'm not cranking in. I'm just watching him, letting him work, being a good dude. And dude's passed out and then he grabbed my, my toe, you know, next to your, your, your big toe, you know, that next one. And uh, snapped it over my toe. It looked like like bad and the skin cracked a little but i you know i had broken that toe a couple times i didn't i was i honestly finished the round then snapped my toe back he was white and i was like hey it's not a big deal you know i've broken that toe a couple times but you can't do that you understand and uh never saw him again but I could tell he I'm not surprised. Yeah. Has anybody seen him again? <laughs> well, he got out of there right quick and I could tell he didn't know what he was doing. He yeah. spazzed out on me. I didn't appreciate it, but I could tell he was scared. And uh, I, like I said, that toe had been broken a couple of times. It was going to bound the break again. So I tried to get it straight as I could taped it up. And then I continued to, you know, I think I sparked two more hours after that, but I continued with the fight camps I was involved in and uh, it just kind of, you know, it's just a toe. So it's not a big deal. It's just uncomfortable, but you fight through it. And uh, eventually I had a little gap, you know, cause when you're a trainer, the fights never stop. Everything's always going. If you're an athlete, you fight and after your fight, you get a little better recovery time. Then you build back up. That's how the camps work. So you never over training kind of deal. And, um, when you're the kind of coach I was, there is no downtime. There's always the next. So I had like a little gap. I'm like, I got a couple of weeks here. I'm going to go have them, you know, maybe re-break the toe and get it set better. And when they did the x-rays and looked at it, they were like, dude, your toes, the joint shattered. And he's like, I have to rebuild it with pins and all this. And I'm thinking, man, it's going to break again. Like in my head, and then he tells me, you know, you're going to, you, no physical contact, six months to a year. And I was like, well, I can't do that. I can't do that. You know, I got people counting on me and this is my life. I'm not going to quit all that for a goddamn toe. Excuse my language. And um, I was like, I want to get it out and take it off. And he said, you know, he was, he was a cool doc, but he, he's like, look, I got to make you wait and think about it. So I had to come back like a week later or something. I was a little frustrated. He made me wait. And I just straight told him, if you don't cut it off, I will. And he said, well, don't do that. Cause he started telling me about phantom toe, all this other crap. So uh, I went in and he took it out and I was back on the mat in about two weeks. And the only reason why the story caught any wind is um, Brian Couture was getting ready for a fight and I was coaching him. So I came in to, 
to watch him spar and um somebody from espn was there you know doing the story i think it was brett Aki, akimoto akiyamo i'm sorry i screwed up. great guy it, brett i can't remember his last name it's been a long time my brain's pretty foggy these days but great dude. So I go in there, you know, I'm watching. And he's looking at me and he knows me. So he's like, you know, what happened to your foot? I told him the story. And he's like, uh, you mind if I write about it? I was like, who's going to care? Who's going to get a rat's ass about my toe? <laughs> sure enough, it caught wind. And I had a buddies that were in D.C. or they were over in the East Coast. Or I got to start getting calls. They're like, dude, I heard these guys talking about you on the radio. I'm like on the radio <laughs> and they're like yeah they're talking about you and ronnie lot i'm like what what yeah. the hell are you talking about i was gonna bring up ronnie's I, name yeah out of all the things i've tried to do you're gonna talk about my toe <laughs> <laughs> and of course randy thought it was awesome because he's a hard bastard so he said, get the toe get the toe we'll put it on a plaque and hang it above my office <laughs> i was like yo i told the dog like i need the toe <laughs> And they, he was like, hey, according to this law, I can't give it to you unless you have a religious reason. I'm like, shit. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not big. I was like, I didn't give a rat's ass. I mean, what am I going to do with this thing, you know? Yeah. But uh, Randy thought it was hilarious. He really wanted to get it. But, uh, I, you know, I just, you know, I tr tried a couple of times and then I had to deal with all the paperwork. And I'm like, it's not worth the struggle. And I got other things going on. But then, uh, you know, some of the guys bought, you know, from the Halloween store, like the toes. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like messing with people, putting in their lockers. And I'm going to bug the door when you walk in. Uh -huh. so hit. You know, they had a little fun with me about that, but I, I guess it's unique. But I didn't see much big deal of it, to be honest. I, I think most people, in my mind, most people in my situation would do that. But maybe, maybe I don't know. I mean, I don't know most people. You know, most of my friends are lunatics. So, yeah. Yeah, I think well, that's the difference is the, the circle you're in. And, and but more importantly, I think what you do for a living, because I think most people that read that story don't need to be there for anybody else. They only need to be there for themselves. And it's like they'll, they'll use it. I've heard you talk about excuses. They'll use it as an excuse to be off the mat for a year. Oh, I can't. Doctor said, you know, I can't. And I think coming from where you're coming from, it's a, it's a much different situation. Not to take away from the insanity of it all, but. Well, the fight game is, is very difficult. And it doesn't matter. As long as you're involved with it, it's difficult. You know, I, I, uh, I know guys that we've had to shoot their hand full of lidocaine before they fight because their hand was broken. But if they don't fight, they don't eat. So that's what happens. Their hand was fractured. Shoot them up full of lidocaine. Doesn't feel anything. Goes out there and fights with it. You know, it's, this stuff happens. All, I know guys that take fights just to get surgery. You know, they got torn ACL and torn groin, and they're going in against a badass wrestler. It's like, dude, what are you doing? You can't take this fight. Dude, I need the money. And I've got to get it fixed. I can't fix it. I can't afford it. So... They go in, commission, you know, they lose, they get a show money, commission pays for them, they get fixed up. This is the lifestyle. It's not, I mean, I have a friend of mine, another famous fighter. He's broken his hand so much. They had to, they had to like rebuild it, all these steel plates. He can't make a full fist. He's still fighting. Mm -hmm. He's just trying to do everything with his other hand. You know, most people, that's insane. Why would you go in there with your hand like that? Isn't that a sign that maybe it's over? No, he's where he's in the life. And when you're in the life, you're never, you have, to, when you're an athlete or a fighter, you got to always think there's way, there's always a way to win. And that attitude uh, will dictate a lot of what kind of athlete, what kind of person you are. You know, I remember tearing my knee out, um, both LCL and MCL really bad right before I was going to go down and train. I think it was Anthony Johnson for the first time. And I remember showing up and I'm limping and I'm like, what, what are we doing ground or, or standing today? Because, you know, when you first meet an athlete, you kind of just see what do you want from me so I can get you what you want, you know, because I'm only there for like a week or so. It's different. Once I moved there and I became this coach, now I'll develop a program. We're going to work together with the other coaches, get, you know, grounded. Right. 
because and the reason so i'm like hey we're doing up or down because i'm going to duct tape my knee you know if we're on the ground i'm going to bend my knee i'm going to duct tape it you know if we're doing other stuff standing i'm going to bend it a little bit duct tape it and that's just the only thing i could do to keep my knee you know and you you know some guys they chew down painkillers they get through it's just the, I tell guys a lot of time about the, the real life of the fight game and they're blown away and how managers will screw over a fighter so they can get their other fighter a good deal or, you know, same with coaches, coaches need money. They kind of encourage a guy to take a fight he shouldn't take because they want their cut. There's, there's a, the, the fight game as awesome as it is when you see fighters, wig out and start saying, I can't take this and all this and all this, you know, I get it because there's so many people screwing them over. I remember one time, long time ago, there was this manager and he's well known. I don't say his name. I mean, I, I don't know if he's still in the game much anymore, but he was back then. He comes in and I'm with this athlete and he's like, okay, I got you a sponsor for shirt and shorts. And they didn't want to do banner, but to build a relationship, because I think this is a good future option. I think we should bring the banner and do it for free. And then next time we'll get paid for the banner and make more money. And luckily this fighter I was with was a street kid right away. He smelled bullshit and he started punching that manager and threw him out of the room. Cause it turned out he didn't get paid for the banner but the managers kept the money and told the athlete, no, 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 you didn't get paid, but you should do it anyways. So like, there's a lot of this game you just get sick of. So when I kind of walked away from the game, it wasn't the, it wasn't the sport or the fighters or any of that. I love that. I love that life. I got sick of the hustle, the business. I got sick of somebody paying me and then everything's cool. And now they're like, you can't train that fighter. You've been training your whole career because I don't, he's not giving me this. And it's just like so much manipulation. I was like, I got to walk away right now. Cause I, I can't, I'm at my limit of bullshit. So you, to speak. Do you think this, this is still happening to that level? I mean, it, it, yeah. as the, as the sport grows and becomes, I mean, I mean, Mixed martial arts is a mainstream at this point. I mean, UFC is almost like every weekend it appears, right? So, does this is this still happening? Yeah, it was mainstream back when I was still coaching. I mean, I only walked away a few years ago. I don't know. I mean, I want to go back to it because I love the job, but I don't want to be no one's head coach. I, I really don't want to deal with the wives, the girlfriends, the managers, and having to smell the BS and all the other crap. I just want to train athletes, help somebody out and do the fun stuff. I mean, being a head coach has a lot of drawbacks. I mean, there's nice things to it, but there's a lot of people hustling, trying to get this. You got new coaches coming in, you know, they try to be a little whisper in someone's ear and they're trying to, this, you'll have people come in. I want to start a new gym and I got money and I've got this guy he's backing it and I want to get you over there. I'll cut you this. I'll pay you to train at my gym. So the fighters like, shoot, I need money, goes there, and then Jim falls apart because you can't, no one's going to shovel money into something like that and lose money for years. It's just not going to happen. Right. You know, it's just, it's constant games. And, um, you know, if you get into yourself, and there are some good teams that are pretty square, pretty square. Uh, they, the, the coaches love their guys. Guys love their coaches. Everybody looks out for each other. But there's another element, and I, and I think that's anytime money's being moved around, you know, he's going to have people trying to, you know, I remember this guy walking in trying to be a manager, and he's like, oh, I got connections in Hollywood. I'll get you this part. I get you this. You have to look. You know this guy. I managed him. I done this, and some of the guys are like, man, I can make some extra money doing this. And I'm thinking, dude, if if he was that good of a manager, he wouldn't be here hustling. You'd be going to him, you know, and it's just, uh, man, I'm, I'm ruining everyone's day. <laughs> no, no, no. This is interesting. So, but, I love the sport and I'm here bitching about it. <laughs> no, but, but listen, so what, so, so obviously all these things are, are big obstacles and this is kind of reality of the business behind the scenes, but what's what? the good stuff? 
What, what's what's the what are those things or what's the one thing that you just said a moment ago that you want to go back? Why do you want to go back? What what's the one thing that really draws you back into being a coach, being a leader, building these guys? Well, I I, I love grinding on the mat with guys. I love um, you can make a difference in someone's life when you're a coach or a teacher. You know, uh, there's a lot of bad ones out there. They're all hustling or whatever, but you can get with a guy's career and you can guide them because there's a lot of information in grappling and fighting. And what can happen is fighters get time. They spend time working on stuff. They, they probably don't need, or it's a low priority. And instead of working on the things that, because when you're a coach, you're not, you should be trying to, you're trying to buy wins. You're trying to get wins. Everything else doesn't matter. You, you're, you're, if you do not produce a product, I don't care what kind of person you are. You might be a wonderful person. You might be a great coach for people. But if you're not producing wins, you know, and when you're a coach, you got to look at it. The wins keep the fighters fighting. If they're losing all the time, they're going to do something else. So it's fun going in there for me and seeing these athletes and I, I'm obsessed with the word optimal, you know, it's like, yeah, you're doing good, but it, the things you're doing, it's not optimal for your style of fighting based on the strategy that goes into a fight or how you're going to win based on the opponents you're going to face. So I love going in there and it's, you see it in their face when it clicks and you can see it in their sparring. And then when they go out there, you're there with them and they get that victory and you get the, it's like, um, it reminds me of being in the service. You know, when I was in the service, I had the great, you know, the, I made the best friends of my life. But you, you're out there and you're in the suck together. You know, it's just miserable. But you're with dudes that you never probably would have met or got along with ever in your life. And you're willing to die for them. You know, it's just a different bond. And when you're on the fight team, that can kind of happen too. And um, there's a, as much as it is a tough sport, there's a love, love there. Like, Hey man, like we had some days together, didn't we? You know? And, uh, I'm not, I've never been really great at anything. You know, I was good. I'm a good shot. Am I great? Well, Jeremy McCulloch's great. You know, if he's great, then I'm not, you know, um, I like being a dog handler. I was good. Was I great? No, you know, um, I was a power lifter. I knew what I was doing, but I was never crazy strong, you know, but when I got into this sport, I found a love and I, I thought, you know, at this point I have become great at something and I love doing it. I love doing what I'm good at. I love doing that feeling. And, um, plus it, it's physically active. I like that too. And some of the best friends I, I have today are all from the fight game. You know, we still stay in touch. And I've even told fighters, you know what, man, I'm hanging it up. Go work with this coach. I think he's a good guy. He's going to help you. And that's how I am. I care about the fighter and his life and victory. I don't care. I don't care about anything else. You know, a lot of times I've worked with fighters. I don't even charge them. I say, just tip me what you want because the experience is valuable to me. So, uh, it, it's just a passion. You know, sometimes you can work with other coaches and it's awesome. Sometimes you and coaches bang heads a little bit. He's got his ideas and you got your ideas, but as long as you guys are producing victories, you guys are a good team, you know? And I can think of many, I think of other times me and a coach banged heads, but we, we had crazy win streaks that don't happen in MMA. So together we're killers, you know, but personality wise, maybe we're not the greatest guys together, but <laughs> We can produce wins and the fighters love it. And it's just cool, man. Being on a team, you're so happy to see them. They're happy to see you. And it's all development. It's all progress. Because the way I look at it, you know, Randy used to always say, it's not about where we are. It's about where we're going. And you get these athletes. And I, I have some psychology um, training so I can help these athletes mentally as well. But I also do it. I don't give them lectures. I, I do it through the training. 
And, and, and part of that is, okay, this is what we're doing. This is what the goal is. You're going to be here by the time of the fight and I'm going to guarantee it for you. All you got to do is stay healthy. Don't worry. You know, and I, I, I don't know. I, I've, I've worked with all different types of athletes and I've made mistakes, um, but I've learned from them. And, um, you know, I'm at a point in my life now where not much does it for me. You know, I could go get a job doing something, but why would I do that when I have something I love to do? I just had to walk away from the business. I, I, it was, it was some manipulation by money men and other things that uh, I just regret, but it, I was in a bad spot and they knew it. I needed to walk away. Let's talk about the coaching part for a bit. Um, you in the beginning, you you mentioned that you are very hands on, that that you love, you know, scrap it with the guys. You want to be in there, not necessarily sitting and pointing a finger and suggesting things, but you actually want to be in part of that that action. What makes it so different between one and the other? Wouldn't okay. wouldn't you being inside not allow you to see a big picture? I don't know. You tell me. No, it feels everything for me feel i gotta feel you if i feel it now i can i can pick pick up the little things that most people don't um for an example you know you try to pair a stimulus with a response you know you do classical conditioning you do operant conditioning all right people listening can look those up kind of deal all right so for example pick an athlete i don't care just just call him joe schmo and say hey okay the way you're working on top in this half guard you're letting the guy control your outside wrist. And what he's doing with that, he's using that to get up. He's using that to get under you for sweeps, or he's using that to attack that arm. And it's happening because your head is not protecting that hand. Okay. You use your head, do the adjustment. So get the athlete. I let him, I dem he demonstrates it on me and I coach him through it. I said, okay, set the clock. All right, we're going to grapple or we're going to spar on the ground, whatever. Cause I like, I like doing a lot of hitting on the ground. So to me, that's more real world than just playing grappling. Cause you can, if you're just grappling, you're going to do things like not protect your head. Mm -hmm. You might buy yourself a little more time in bad situations, but when you're hit, it, it's a rush, rush, rush. And you got to, you don't want to get that moment where you're holding your breath because you feel anxious to escape. You want to get comfortable with it and understand and be predictable, right? You want to smell everything, so to speak. So let's just say, okay, we're doing the, I'll start somewhere else. I won't start in that position. May I start on a single leg, take them down. Then I'll let them work and I'll piss them off a little bit. Then I'll let him get top position. I'll just let him, you know, he's winning, right? And then I'm finding my way into half guard on the bottom. And then I'll grab that wrist. I'll give him like one to two seconds. If he doesn't do what he's supposed to, I immediately change speeds and I'll submit him. I'll work. I'll get up um, and I'll try to hurt him a little, not hurt, but I'll make it a little mean. And he'll be like, damn. I said, Hey man, you let me control your wrist. Oh shoot. All right. Let's try it again. Do a couple more reps. Does a couple more reps. Okay. Let's go. This time I start some, he's behind me. So now he dumps, dumps me with a gunt wrench or something. We start going, hitting each other, you know, maybe a minute in. I'm doing that to distract him, okay? So his mind is not thinking about it because if I go right to the situation, of course he's going to do it. Right. Yeah, but that's not a test, you know? If I, if, if I show him how to do it and then we jump into the position and he does it right, that's not a test. That's guidance, you know? That shouldn't count at all. So you got to have, you got to get them in the mix. You got to get them emotional. You got to get them distracted. Next time I grab that wrist. If I'm being nice, I'll give it a little shake or something to kind of bring awareness to it. If he doesn't do it again, I tune him up hard, you know, <laughs> snap that triangle, do something to him, get him a little pissed. And he's going to say, what the fuck? And I'm going to say, man, you let me grab that wrist. Every time you let me do that, I'm going to hurt you, you know, but I'm really not going to hurt him. You know, I'm not going to break anything. I don't do that, but I'm going to turn it on you. You know, you're going to, you're going to feel what I can do. Let him drill a couple more times. Then same situation. We start somewhere else. Maybe we start standing against the wall, slam me down or I take him down and then let him get back on top. The same story I just told you. 
get back in that half guard position, grab that wrist. This time he beats it. He defends it. Then I go a little soft. I can, I don't feel as strong. And then all of a sudden he passes. Then he gets the arm triangle and I let him put me to sleep. Okay. Put me dead asleep. So one is black and white, right? One is this. I, he, he, I, he let him control my wrist. He fucked me up. This one, I beat it. And not only did I just beat it, I won and I put him to sleep. He doesn't know what I'm doing. If I'm going harder, letting him have it because I'm lying to him with my body. But that thing is in there. He passed the test. And for the rest of the camp, every time I grab that wrist, that son of a bitch defends it immediately. To get an athlete to do that in a shorter matter of time, there has to be something like this. Now, these are some of my coaching secrets, but you can't, you can't ask another athlete to do that. So if I have another fighter say, okay, this is your drill partner, he needs some juice too. He's not going to let you just choke him out or all this mm -hmm. stuff. He's a fighter too. He needs to eat too. So what it really comes down to, you either have to pay your training partners so they would come in and be that guy. And who knows if they're going to feel it right. They don't know. You're not, they're not specialists. They're trying to learn too. So if I'll do it and because granted I, I my weight can fluctuate, but I'm a heavyweight generally. Okay. I can do it with heavyweights. I can handle their weight. I can deal with it. I go, I used to grapple with Dom Cruz and Chandler all the time. I just, I play it a little different, let them work. You know, they don't need to feel my strength. You know what I'm saying? I'll make myself smaller. I'll play the small man's game. I focus more on scrambles and they get the work and my body can hit, take it. So I'll let them punch me a lot more. You know, there's time I let Chandler put me to sleep 15 times in one practice, but that's to eliminate pausing. The big problem I see with a lot of submissions, everybody pauses, they go for, they go for it and then they squeeze a little and they wait for the tap. No, you're not committing. You need to, you don't cut a guy's head off by just kind of, trying to saw it <laughs> you gotta swing hard but that look at chandler's submission history he has a lot of submissions and they're brutal mm -hmm. they're absolutely brutal because i was able to coach him backwards and because he had my body that could handle it he never pauses when he goes for something you're dead he used to always joke he did after every time he would do something <laughs> okay but that's what i'm saying it this takes work this takes your body this takes sweat and only I on the ground can feel it. Whether I see or not, I can feel it. I can feel like, oh man, his weight is a little shifted to this. That's not optimal because I know how to beat this. Now you might get another jujitsu practitioner. How, how long is he going to stay there and take punishment? He's not, unless he's getting paid good money, but I'm just a sick bastard that <laughs> can take the punishment. But let me ask you, I mean, that's a lot of wear and tear on you as a coach. Yeah. That's why I'm, I mean, I'm 45 and I've got white facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, so do I. <laughs> I, I, I don't die nothing, you know, but, uh, yeah. But, no, but, is that, but on a serious note, is that sustainable? I mean, from, from, for you as a coach to put yourself in the positions where, you know, you got unconscious 15 times or you get, you, you, you get pressured into these positions, you know, for the greater good of the fighter. I get that part, but. The other side is you paying the ultimate price here. You know, it, it, it roughed me up and I needed to looking back, I need some surgeries. I need to get a little healthier, but for me, I needed to produce wins. Cause remember when you were, I wasn't a competitor, you know, I, I, I was competing. And then once I got Pichette's disease, I was really messed up. And then they finally, I was blind in both eyes. You know, they got my vision back in one eye, went deaf in one ear. I, you know, I was, I went broke, you know, because of medical prices. And then the medicine they used to treat the disease was making me very sick. Anyone that, uh, on any fight team I've been on, it's like Neil's great, but he's sick all the time. A lot of that was from the medicine and not so much the disease. So it was difficult. That being said, when you don't have that, giant competition background okay i felt like you know like in the service if you're gonna lead you lead from the front and for me 
I need to be on the mat sweating and bleeding. I need, and I'll lose too, you know, I'll like, Oh, great. I'm going with this great wrestler. I'm not a great wrestler. I'm probably going to get thrashed. And the fighters see Neil's Neil's out here grinding with us. He knows exactly what our bodies are feeling like. Neil's going to get, let us choke him out. Neil's going to do this. Neil's going to do that. Neil's going to pay the price for us. I'm willing to do what it takes to win. And maybe, and other coaches, they're looking out for themselves. That's cool. They want to do this. That's cool. And I'm sure there's a lot of great coaches that do that. They have great minds. They're great people. But for me, I needed to, I knew careers were short. I knew I wouldn't be doing this forever. And I wanted to go all in. And sometimes I made mistakes. Sometimes I did a lot of smart things. Um, I, I wish I had been a little healthier and I had backed off some of the the medicine, because it was one of those things I could, I could choose one or the other. I can go compete and try to be an athlete and that's it. Or I can be a coach and that's it. I can't do both. My health could, a lot of times when I would go hard, I would need days down because I, I can't get back. Now I'm more healthy now, as far as my heart and everything, but I take almost no medicine for the disease because the disease kind of went into remission. Thank Christ. So I'm feeling better than ever right now. Um, I really wish it was like that in my thirties and where it was full scale. I mean, I was sick all the time. Um, it, it was, it was rough. I'd get a lot of times I'd get, uh, you know, people get staph infections. Well, the medicine I would take lowers my immune system so much. Every time I got a little staph infection, my, it, my, I would be in the hospital for a week. You know, my arm would blow up double its size. You know, it's really, but I was like, it's the squeeze is worth the juice. You know, I I don't care. You know, I don't think it's going to kill me. You know, I'll be okay. I just got to suffer a little bit. And, uh, you know, I loved what I was doing. I was loving what I was doing. I didn't want to stop. It's like a, like a, a drug addict, but I was addicted to the, to the game, I guess. Is, is fighting addicting? Well, I, I, I'm not, I like it a lot to me. It, it, it does a lot of good things for my mind. And I, I, I love the chess game of it, but I'm not in the cage with the rush. I mean, I feel it on the outside, you know, but it's a lot different being, you know, the coach outside the cage and then the athlete in there, you know, um, I would have to, you know, we'd have to ask that athlete when the crowd screamed. But, but baseball, uh, but baseball, yeah. what you've seen, I mean, you've seen athletes in and out of the cage so many times. You've trained so many of them. And even at the beginning of this conversation, you said that a lot of them don't want to quit. They, they, they don't want to hang the gloves. They, they're they looking for this next event, for the next fight. They keep well, pushing it. Do you, th- do you think that, that that adrenaline rush is is addicting to to, to some of these guys? It's addicting for a lot of things. Why do people, you know, drip, jump out of, you know, jump off cliffs and bird suits and that's true. You know, cruise between two pieces of mountain where if they hit it, they're dead in every possible way. Yeah. I have tons of friends that died doing it, but they just love it. And, you know, it's just, we have, sometimes you just find something and as, as crazy as it is, it, it puts you at peace. Yeah. You know, like a lot of, I never go to post fight parties you know and they well, some of the fighters don't like that but for me it's like you won i already had my party i'm gonna go get some goddamn sleep because i'm the one <laughs> you know skull fucking this all day like did we do this we do that how is he doing is he all right you know like it's uh you won i get that little rush pat you on the back and then i'm ready to go back to the room and finally get some sleep is uh is the competition so you know, after you were competing, is the competition for you personally, is it what's happening on the mats and what they're picking up, or is it the win? Once the win happens, your your competition is, is over for that particular point in time. Uh, it's both. It's fun watching develop. Man. I've seen a guy, I, I thought this has happened to me many times. I've been on fight teams, whether it be an athlete, and in a coach's meeting, they're like, yeah, he's good body for our higher end fighters um but he's a waste of time because we don't think he's got the stuff and i look at that I'm like well he's on our team like shouldn't shouldn't somebody try to see what he can do 
but they're looking at it from their lens Mm -hmm. and they're feeling pressures from the guys and the managers and everything as well. So it's not like they're heartless people. Uh, But I look at it and say, Oh yeah, well, he sucks at this part, but with that body type, I would do this and I would do that. And I'm, I'll go and grind with him and see what happens. See if I can do something with them. And boom, turns them around. All of a sudden he's getting a title shot because he just beat five guys in a row. It's just like, wow. You know, the, you know, you never know who can walk in there and you never know what people can become unless you give it a shot. You got to give it a shot, you know, but you know, it's, it, I get it. If you have a lot of people coming and going, so people are hopping camps like, Oh, I'm going to do a camp here. And then I'm going to go do a camp here. The camp, you don't, how much energy are you going to invest in them? You know, he's just yeah, going to use true. one fight. If he's just using me for one fight, I'll train him. I'll get whatever pay. And, but I'm, I'm, he's not going to get my heart and blood, you know? Um, I want that guy that's going to give me a chance, you know, something I can build, do at least a few camps with. And then if we're not having success, my thing is if we're training you the best we can uh, and you're not having success, I'm the first guy to say, Hey, I think go try this other coach. He's pretty cool at this stuff. Maybe you'll have better luck. Cause I really want everybody to do well. And whether they're with me or not, I'm not a, I don't hate athletes at all. I, I, I tend to have a lot of big heart for them um, cause they're risking it all too. You know, they're definitely pulling a lot on, li- on their line. Do you have a recollection of one event or one fighter that, you know, it was like, it was completely mind blowing, you know, either positive or, ne- or negative, but, you know, at the end, it was like, damn, whew, this is over. Let's let, let's let, let's get to the next one. I mean, those circumstances have happened multiple times. And, you know, one thing about me is I don't I don't really talk much. I might talk about the training room, but I don't name names, you know, and those kind of things. I think they're just for me and the athlete. You know what I'm saying? I agree. Uh, we we've had a, a lot of athletes climb and get there and then it just hit, this hits the end or they, they just, I see it and they have the talent, but you know, they have a personal life that's affecting it. I've known guys, their girlfriends or wives come in and we have their training schedule all worked out and what he's going to do. And the girl comes in and says, well, I want him home more. So he can't do this, this, and this. And it's like, yeah, but you guys live off the money he makes with his fists. And that ath- and that's what the guy agrees to do. We're not training him optimally. And, you know, he doesn't get the success. But, you know, he's choosing that this woman is worth that adjustment. And, you know, it's heartbreaking on our side, but that's his choice. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to tell him to break up with her. It's not my business. And, um, so sometimes it's sad when you see that, you know, sometimes guys die, you know, I had a a fighter, Jordan, you know, Parsons is very close to me and he followed me to a couple of camps and great record, crazy dedicated and overtrained all the time. We couldn't kick him out of the gym and he, he got killed crossing the street by some rich kid that was doing like 120 and a 45. And it was a hit and run, hit him so hard, his leg came off. And it was crazy because I talked to the officer that was quickly on the scene and uh, Jordan didn't know his leg was gone. And the cop, apparently Jordan was telling him, how's my leg? I got a fight coming up. I need to be all ready. Is it okay? And the cop's like, yeah, you're going to be all right. Let's just keep you. And they, he was in the hospital. They, they Luckily, they were able to keep he lost a lot of blood. They were able through donors to get enough blood in him, but then he had a mushroom brain injury that happens days later and he was brain dead. And I was there pulling the plug and I was with his family when we pulled it. And the thing is this kid was going somewhere and he was working his fucking ass off. Like he had, if you, I saw his room, he had all these things he had printed out like, you're never too tired to do another 30 minute run. Like this guy, he come in everything, living poor to try to cast his dream. And it was over. And eventually the guy that hit him, the idiot, 
you try to get the car fixed on an auto bond and body shop. And that guy was like, screw this, called the cops. And we caught the guy, but he's, you know, he's a rich kid. He had a pet tiger at his house. Like he's one of those types. And, um, he got sentenced like seven years or something. But the sad part is this guy had his license taken away five times for drinking and driving. And they gave it back to him again. So his sixth time, then he kills Jordan. You know what I'm saying? It made me very angry. Very, very angry. Um, Can I imagine? Uh, man, I'm not talking about anything good. <laughs> no, but, no, but these are life lessons, you know? And, and it, even now I'm thinking about, as, you, as you're talking through this story, you know, you have, we, we have these athletes and people who will have a lot of passion for what they do, um, whether fighting or something else, and they'll they'll do anything to get better at it. And then at the same time, on the flip side, we have others who will often find excuses and million reasons why they should give up. And I'm curious, in your mind as a coach, what separates the guys who are truly successful and the others who will find literally every obstacle on the way to their success? Are you talking about professional athletes or hobbyists? Well, let's go both ways. Let's start with the hobbyist. Let's start with the hobbyist. That's more common to, you know, general population. Well, I think most hobbyists, it's like a love thing. They don't fully love it um, if they're going to quit, you know, um, or they're just not very, they're just not very tough because, you know, your body goes through a hardening process mm -hmm. when you're training all the time, like to a point where you stop getting really bruises. You know, when you first start, you get a lot of bruises and everything aches, your neck hurts a lot, but over time your body toughens up and you get a little tougher, a little stronger, and your mind gets a little sharper, tougher, and you, and you start falling in love with it. That, I mean, that's what happened to me. I just fell in love with it. I was like, wow, I can, I can spar, I can fight, I can do all this. And it's not out of hate, you know, it's just, it's just a sport. And I like that, you know, I don't want to be on the street, like hurting people. I don't want to do that stuff. I want to, I want to do the sport, you know? Um, and I think a lot of hobbyists, they just don't, it's been a while since I work with hobbyists, but I just don't think they, I think they're there because it's cool or um, they want to learn a few things, but uh, they're very quick to find a reason out. You know, I, I, I remember one time I, on my grappling team, I had a guy that was 50 years old and he's out there rolling with kids in their prime, like 20 years old, 21, even 18. And he competes, he was competing in his age bracket. And then that the, everybody else's age bracket, 50 years old. That's a guy that loves it. You know, he, he, he was hurt and tired and red all the time, but he was a stud, man. That guy was a stud. That's like Gary. Yeah, please. <laughs> uh, I think, do you, so do you, I, I wonder if it's the process. People don't give it enough time. Maybe, you know, I know. If you don't love it, you shouldn't do it. Yeah. You should do it at the time. It, it's not mandatory. Uh -huh. it's now, but you're not going to love it until you start getting victories. Yeah. I noticed when I came into jujitsu, it was like, oh, this, after a little bit, it was like, oh, this isn't what I thought it was. But you got to give it more time so you can develop into it and decide if it's really for you. And I think people give up on that way too soon. Um, I Just as a hobbyist myself, really, um, they don't give enough time to to get through those those early peaks and valleys and the bumps and bruises and the ego hit and... Once you, I think once you do all that, then it's like, okay, I know you find yourself in it. Right. I think you find out who you are. And if you, if at that point, uh, it's still for you, then I think that's when the love starts developing, at least for me, I, it wasn't like, oh, I can, you know, I didn't get in there right away and be like, yeah, I love it. It was okay. Maybe I'm not who I thought I was, but now mm -hmm. I'm learning these things and, um, it's, it's developing a little bit and, and now I do. I think people just need to give it a little more time, you know, and blue and getting your blue belt's not enough time. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well. So yeah. what about professionals? Do you think that 
what separates the ones who truly achieve their success versus the ones that, you know, they, they, they find ways out or ways kind of maneuver through, through this whole thing, but not really reach their optimal success. Well, some people have athletic backgrounds. Maybe they wrestled or played football and fighting is a way to keep living that athlete lifestyle, you know, and, and sometimes they see it, you know, the guys that are successful, they got, you know, they're making some money now. They got the girls. Some people like that kind of stuff, but their heart's not fully in it. So when they start doing it, they kind of, uh, I think they just maybe hit a hit a wall where they realize, wow, this this is going to take some real dedication, and my heart's not in it. And if that's the case, you shouldn't do it. You can get really hurt, you know. Um, other people, yeah, yeah, you know, it, it, we all. Th- I've had people, you know, like if I dedicate myself, I'll be in the UFC in two years. I'm like, no, you won't, because you already put a marker in your head where if things don't go my way, I'm going to quit. It's not going to go your way. You're going to have failure. You're going to have to grind. You're going to fail in the gym to the point where you might sit there and look in the mirror and say, this is not for me, but I can't let it beat me. I'm coming back the next day. You know, if that's the way you, person you are. And, um, there's gotta, I, I really think there's got to be some love in it. I know some fighters lose all the time, still doing it, still love the life, still love going out there and, and taking a crack at it, still believing they can get better, you know, and that's awesome, you know. Those are the people that probably should look to do something else, but they, they, they're not done. They're not done. They're, they're not on empty yet. They still got stuff they need to get out, They and they love it, and – that's nice. That's uh, it's admirable. Some people, it's you know, we're you know, very you know, I can be obsessive compulsive. I know others can, and they just they just can't think about anything else. You know? It definitely takes a lot to 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 be to be in this pos- that position and and really grind it to that level to achieve that level of success as you as you are talking about. Um. You know, as this conversation is unfolding, you know, we, we've been done this for almost an hour uh, as, as, as it's happening. Um, one of the things, Neil, that we do at, the, at some point of the episode is we have a question from our previous guest who was sitting in your seat. But they didn't know it's going to be you answering the question, so it creates kind of a unique, unique situation here. And Gary's going to take a lead um, on, on that question, and um, this is going to be interesting. Yeah, this is a good one. This is from Scott George Atlas, um, and he wants to know, what are the co-adaptive skills of jiu-jitsu, and how do you apply them to your outside life? Uh, so how the skills of jujitsu has affected the outside of my life? I think so. Yeah. yeah so like he's getting the at. skills they use on the mat, how did you use the same skills out off the mat essentially? Right. Yeah, I think so. Mm. I mean, that's a, that's a tough question. Some of the, a lot of times the skills off the mat are the ones that I brought to jujitsu, you know, Let's hear those then. If you if you want to flip it, that's fine. Well, it's, it, you got to learn. Being being in the service, you know, a lot of times peer pressure is a wonderful thing. You know, like um, I wasn't a reader, but when I joined the service, my buddies looked at me like I was a shit bag because I wasn't a reader. So I started reading and next thing you know, I was reading constantly. I had friends that thought I was an idiot because I only spoke one language, you know, so I had to learn other languages. So that's good peer pressure. So um, when you get into an environment and you bring over to the world of grappling or fighting, you want to you want that peer pressure to be good like that like hey you didn't do you're not doing abs after practice you're not doing this you're a shit bag doesn't matter who you are 
and that can carry over to a lot of positive things to make yourself better. But, you know, a lot of the things that I've gotten from grappling, I already, I already did, you know, um, I always, I was always, um, when I got something in my head, I was obsessive compulsive about it. Jiu-Jitsu didn't give that to me. I was already that way. And that kind of mindset is what made my grappling game unique and advanced in a very short amount of time. I was not talented. I didn't, nothing came easy to me. I know those guys, everybody hates those guys. <laughs> but, uh, no, I was like everybody else. I had to lose and lose and lose. And I've even had friends tell me, Neil, you're, you have a good career to stick with that. Don't do this. But I was like, well, I'm going to keep coming, you know, and jujitsu didn't give that to me. I was already that way. Um, practice. I mean, I was always practicing no matter what I did, you know, I had to practice all the time, just grappling, you know, that mindset when I switched over, I already knew what I had to do. I just like, I right away, I, I figured out, Oh, my problem is my coordination. Well, I'm being a shit bag. I need to focus on coordination drills. I need to do double the time as everybody else. I was already that way. So you is know? that, so is that hard work ethic? What set you successful in your career as a coach and, you know, just having that, that ability to replace the, the, the gift, if you will. Well, my, I, I, been like that since I was a kid. My father, um, I don't know if he didn't know how else to raise me or whatever, but um, like he, I was playing football. He like found out and he was like, you're quitting football. And next thing you know, I was working. Um, I, I was work. I worked all the time. Even when I was a little kid, I had, you know, I was cutting people's lawns for money or doing a paper route. And then I'd go do side jobs and paint or, always working so i didn't really know much else and i knew and you know being in the service you want to stand out and be successful be the hardest worker um that will get you somewhere so work ethic was is never a problem it's just that you know when you're doing stupid job you don't like your boss or you don't like something you're less likely to work harder but you don't realize if you work harder then life's going to get better for you you'll be the boss, you know? So I've always had a hard work ethic, but I, I just didn't have a lot of interests, you know? And that was the other problem. I just didn't have a lot of interests. Um, I would try something like, Oh, I'm, I like this. I'm going to do this for a while, but I didn't love it. But when it came over to wrestling, grappling and MMA, I found something I loved and I don't even love watching it anymore. Like I'll watch it, but I, when you're a coach, you look at everything differently. You know, it's like when you watch comedians, watch other comedians, they're not really laughing. They're looking at the craft, they're just, right? They're looking at the setup and all the other things that go into making a comedian that we don't care about. We just want to hear funny stuff. And when you're a coach or you're a training athlete, you're, while well, everybody's watching the fight, I'm watching his feet, you know, I'm watching his back leg. I'm, I'm saying, Oh, wow, this guy's cage control is terrible. Or man, this guy's doing a great job of cutting off and not chasing or my oh, man, he, he should have, he's got his elbow. He should be on his hand. That will help him get out faster. You know, I'm not I'm just sitting back and just like, Oh, enjoying the fight. And I still have a lot of guys I coach out there fighting. So I'm the whole time I'm worried. Like, man, I don't, I hope these coaches are getting this guy ready. You know, like, I don't want to see this guy, you know, you know, when you, when you love what you do and you really have a close contact with an athlete for a long time, you don't really trust anyone to do the job because you're like, I might not be perfect. I don't know it all, but I'm willing to, I'm willing to do everything I fucking can for you to be successful. I'm willing to pay the damn man. I got to pay the man one way or the other you know, to make sure I've done everything I can. So when you walk into that fight, I could say, I've done everything I can, you know, and sometimes you can't say that. It's just because circumstances guys hurt, you know, takes fight short notice, you know, you know, you're not prepared, but if the athlete's choice, he wants to go make some money. He's going to go make some money. 
But you know, to say jujitsu brought something over to my life, personal, I don't know. I think it's, uh, I think it's had its positives and negatives. Um, you know, um, it, it kind of, I've been content to be a nomad. You know, I don't have, I don't own anything. I don't own a home. You know, I don't, I'm not super invested anywhere because, you know, I, I want to go train athletes and wherever those athletes are or wherever something you know, like that's going to be and where I can be doing that. That's where I want to go. Um, I like to be somewhere, you know, nice and I can afford, but you own a home now you're, it's, you know, coaching can't be the priority. You have investments, you got to stay, you got to do this. What if, what if the team dies? What if the money backing drops out, you know? So I would say that um, what jujitsu or MMA have done for me is it's, it's kind of kept me from staying in one place a little bit. And um, there's pros and cons to that, you know, it's pros and cons. I know other guys, they're, fat and happy, you know, living simple lives with families or whatever. But if you want to be on the move, you want to be with these athletes, that's, you know, the sacrifices have to be made. So. Wow. I mean, what a, what, what a beautiful story. Um, it, it, I, I, I have a hard time wrapping all the stuff that you are talking about in my mind. So much, um, so much experience that you've had. Um, over over the years and everything that you've done for the athletes and I, honestly, I mean, it, people like you—that's who why the the art, the sport continues growing. A lot of passion there, a lot of passion there. Before we wrap this up, formally, where where are you at now? Where where are you doing these days? Where can anybody find you if anybody wants to reach out to you? Are you accessible on social media? Yeah, I just have Instagram for right now. I'm not a not a very social person, so I'm a little bit of a hermit, but uh, I'm in Las Vegas, but uh, I'm looking to uproot again. I got some friends down in South Florida that are doing some stuff, and um, I might want to jump in that and have some fun getting back with athletes, but I got some good friends in SoCal too, but the thing about I don't want to live in SoCal just because of, you know, things we have to worry about other things now. Like if I had a gym and and I'm in a state that is real little lockdown, you know, um, heavy, uh, he's going to just, I'd have a lot of friends that lost their ass on their businesses because of lockdowns. And mm -hmm. I don't want to be that guy. And unfortunately, California was one of the, you know, heavy lockdown places. So now you have to worry about, stuff that we didn't have to worry about before. I, I would love to be back in SoCal, but I, I just don't see it happening. So, you know, Florida is a good state to go where, you know, you're probably not going to get shut down. You can, you're free to work a business. There's other States. Um, it'd be nice to be somewhere pretty, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm cruising. I'm keeping my mind open. Um, uh, an opportunity will come my way that will feel right. And that will be the opportunity I jump on. I love it. I love it, Gary. Yeah. He's also got, I mean, if you're looking for, for Neil out there, there's a ton of stuff on BJJ fanatics, your website, there's a, a lot of places you can go to gain um, some information. So and yeah, as always, we'll, out. we'll put all the links in the show notes. Uh, so you guys can connect with Neil directly if that's what you desire. Yeah. And then again, Neil, Thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for sharing all the uh, world of wisdom. Um, we do appreciate the last hour of your time, and uh, we'll be watching from the sidelines as you return into coaching and, and, and everything that you're doing in your life. Well, thanks for having me, and I appreciate everybody's uh, support. And um, It's nice to be back out there again. Uh, like Sometimes you got to walk away. So you come back, um, other words, just kind of turn South and it's, I walked away, but I'm, I'm full of life. I'm very happy. I'm healthy. And I, I have a raw appetite to get back in the swing of things. And that's, that's a good place. That's a good place to, 
go do good things. So I thank everybody uh, if they've tuned in to listen to this and thank you guys for having me on. It's very, uh, it's very kind of you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, good luck with everything. I think that's great that, uh, you know, if we're any little part of that, that's awesome. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Let's wrap this up. Peace. Thanks so much. Stay filthy. Thank you for listening to Raw Radio. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review and help us make the show even more amazing. For future episodes, check out our website and follow us on all major podcast platforms. Take care.